Finland and has come here to help us with this seminar. Ulla Klutzer. Yes, I've been for too long, but it's not my fault. It's the nuclear industry's fault. Um, uh, when listening to the speakers before, the recent speakers, um, it seems that Sweden is going to get the biggest ESS project in the world, and Finland is going to get the biggest nuclear power reactor in the world. And we will most probably be the first nation in the world to uh, uh, start uh, putting uh, spent fuel into the ground. We will even beat the Swedes once, once in a time. Uh, the construction of the... Uh, I have been asked to talk, first of all, about the construction of the Finnish uh, nuclear power plant and uh, the waste storage. So I start with the Olkiluoto 3 plant being built in Finland at the moment. The construction of this reactor started uh, in 2005. It's called Olkiluoto 3 and it's built by TVO, which is a wholesaler of energy to the industry. Uh, this reactor is going to be the prototype of a prototype, because we say it's a prototype. But the French building the same reactor now in France say it's a prototype. Hmm. So we must be the prototype of the prototype. <laughs> <laughs> it is an EPR reactor, a European pressurized reactor. It, it was bought for a turnkey pre price of 3.2 billion euros from the French-German company Areva. Uh, that desperately needed this deal in order to be able to go out and promote a nuclear renaissance in the world. When the project was discussed in the Finnish parliament in 2002, it was promoted as a cheap solution to tackle climate change. We know that. It's, it's the argument they use all the time. The price mentioned in the debate in the parliament was 2.3 billion euros. It was bought at 3.2 billion euros. And according to French sources, all the delays and the technical problems, etc., to which I will return, uh, will raise the price by at least 2.2 billion euros. Then we are up in 5.5. I said from the beginning it will be 7. And I think they are going to beat me, which is quite good. Although the price was a turnkey price, uh, the Finnish company, uh, TVO, and Areva are, of course, now struggling. Because Areva says, okay, well, it was a turnkey price, but we are pals, we are companions, and companions should be solidar to each other, and we should, we should uh, do something with the cost. And we have made, uh, uh, I have said already for a long time, uh, when the first reactor will be ready, uh, the Oculoto 3, they have plans for more they are going to have a big, big, big uh, fight in the court. But they have to row this project ashore first. The reactor was supposed to start producing energy in 2009. At this moment, the production is estimated to start in 2011. <laughs> I say 2012, and I'm very positive in that respect. Due to the de delay, the consumers will also get a nice bill. According to Elfin, which is owned by 24 big Finnish companies in order to promote uh, cheap energy for themselves. Mm -hmm. The delay cost for the, listen, for the Nordic energy consumers will be 3 billion euros. So you, all the Swedish people here, will also pay for this nice reactor. Uh, and this is because this cheap electricity will not be in the market in time, in 2009, as they promised. Um, on top of that, the energy companies have, will have to buy emission rights for at least 500 million euros. I say it's going to be a billion, because it's going to be even later. And also this bill will be transferred to us on the prices. Olkiluoto 3 has been hit with a lot of safety problems from the first beginning. A report by the Finnish Radiation and Nuclear Safety Authorities called Stuk published in July 2006, clearly shows the problems, and I will mention only a couple. There, there, it's, a, it's a report of many, many, many pages. But the report stated that the number of subcontractors is large. It's more than 2,000 from 28 different countries, only 40% from Finland. Some of these subcontractors have no previous 
ex experience in constructing nuclear reactors. Uh, the decision factor when they choose the subcontractors, and this is took, not me, in the final phase was generally the total price tag of the offer. If the, bigger, uh, the bidder met the specified criteria, which was low, the report drew attention uh, to the fact that the vendor has selected subcontractors which have no exp <coughs> prior experience in nuclear uh, power plant uh, construction and that they have had no sufficient guidance and supervision to ensure the smooth progress in their work. Listen to this, they are building the biggest reactor in the world. It also <coughs> stated that the management and the organizations participating in the constructions do not fully comply with Stuck's the authorities' expectations concerning good safety culture. Furthermore, they said that time and resources needed for the detailed design of the unit were clearly underestimated when the overall schedule was agreed upon. Actually, they have no final plan. They are doing the plan when they are building. And you could never get the permission to build such a house in the world, no, or in the, in the European world. Mm. Already, at an early stage, the process of designing the concrete composition, the concrete manufacturing and quality control measures involve big problems. This is not now the stuck, this is what happened uh, overall. The approved concrete composition was altered during concrete mixing. So they made a new recipe. Deviations in the concrete composition and in concrete pouring were not addressed openly and without delay as they should have been. There were problems with the manufacturing of the reactor containment steel liner. The function of the steel liner is to ensure the leak tightness of the containment. That is to prevent any leaks of radioactive substances into the environment in case of a reactor damage. The, exactly the same problems they now have in Flamanville, the second prototype. At the beginning of August, I mean just a month ago, a fire took place in the Olki Lotto 3 construction site. The first news stressed that it was a fire of minor importance, no, no big deal. A couple of days later, it turned out to have caused substantial damage in the wall construction. The outer wall structures, as well as those of the inner wall, were defected. Major concreting operations will be needed. The repair works are now estimated to take several months, but it was just a minor fire. Who cares? Mid-August, a current affairs television program of the Finnish Broadcasting Company drew attention to serious security breaches in welding work at the Olkiluoto 3 site. Two reports concerning these accusations were made by Stuck, the, the radiation authorities, and handed over to the Ministry of Employment and Economy, which is uh, um, um, responsible for this building. Both reports, as we expected, attached attention to some minor problems, but the overall message was that everything was okay. Mid-August, Associated Press reported that several employees, including some in manager, managers, have reportedly left because of irregularities during the early construction phase. They just leave because they can't stand this building going on. Um, at the end of August, the Finnish Construction Trade Union issued a strike warning for the Okiloto 3 building site. It says there are irregularities concerning Polish construction workers. The French company Bouguette, who is one of the, the subcontractors, has refused to explain how builders, taxes, and social security payments are being done. So it, you see, it's, it's a big uh, flop, the whole thing. And the last, which I read when I came on the plane, uh, the last scandals concern Jukka Laaksonen, who is the general director of the Radiation Safety Authority, Stuck. In the half-year report of Areva, which was published last week, 
the French company, uh, uh, the French company building that is building the, the third reactor, uh, is publishing a content of a letter which Jukka Kalaksonen has sent to the general manager of Areva and Lovagron. This list letter gives serious reason to question Stuck's position as a neutral control authority. And I quote the letter. I want to assure you that my judgment of the Olkiluoto 3 project success is based solely on the actual performance of Areva in providing adequate quality and safety. In spite of some difficulties met in the past, I have no doubt about the acceptability of the final product. I have tried to indicate in all of my discussions with the technical and public audience that I am still very pleased with the choice made by TVO when they signed the contract with Areva in 2003. I fully recognize the value of Areva's pioneering work in re-establishing the capability for nuclear construction in the Western world and in the US. And I do not believe that any other company could have done better in these circumstances. Amen. <laughs> <laughs> this is the general manager of the highest authority of safety in Finland. They are not neutral. Okay, this is the Olkiluoto catastrophe and I hope all of you will help us to make it true that it never could be taken into use. But that's a dream, maybe. The final disposal of spent fuel. In, in Finland, the, this disposal is, uh, the repository is being built at the moment in Olkiluoto, close to the, this catastrophe reactor. This, the decision was taken in Parliament in 2001. Uh, we have two, 200 parliamentarians, 159 voted yes, Three voted no, and the rest were absent. Also, the whole, uh, all the, uh, except one, I think, of the Green Party members voted yes. At present, there is an environmental impact assessment going on, running for the enlargement of the repository because we get this new reactor and we have plans for three more new reactors. Um, no discuss in this uh, environmental impact assessment. There were no discussion at any level about the problem uh, which is discussed for the EPR reactor with burn up rates of 60 gigawatt days per ton of uranium, or even more. At these rates, the uranium fuel rods should burn for around a year longer than today's best fuel up, uh, burn, burn fuel up, uh, burn up fuel. And this high burn up fuel uses more enriched uranium and leaves it in the reactor for a longer time and it gets real hot. In the IAEA guidebook published in September 2007, it states, the higher burn-up of fuel has a significant impact on the choice of the storage option and on the design of the storage systems due to the, <coughs> to the increased decay heat, interalia, which is roughly proportional to burn-up, imposing a higher cooling load to the storage system. In the new environmental impact assessment, there is no word about this. Um, in Sweden and Finland, uh, we have the same final repository model, the KBS method about which Niklas will be talking later, so I won't go very much into this. And there is a lot of problem and there is a lot of this debate and discussion, there is even money to debate. In Finland there is no debate and no money. <laughs> uh, but I would like to mention that uh, Sven Bengtsson, who is the highest judge of the environmental court in Sweden, uh, in Milieu Actuel in 2007 that said that the SKB will might be started, the, the, your, your repository might be taken into use in 2022-20 because there is a long procedure about uh, choosing the locality and the whole um, environmental process you have, the court process. Uh, we have no such problems. The timetable is very fast. We are there already at the depth of, of, of uh, 296 meters. Uh, in 2002, it stated that the loading will start. Okay, it might be po postponed by some five years, but yours might be po postponed by some ten years. So, um, this is dangerous. 
Because if we are the first ones, and we likely will be the first ones operating, uh, taking into use a repository in the whole world, uh, we might get more waste. In the IAEA, as well as in the European Union circles, it has many times been mentioned that it would be very practical with some waste repositories uh, at the best possible places. Uh, if you consider that appro approximately one third of the nuclear power uh, plants operating in Europe, in EU, will be closed over the next two decades, you might realize that this is going to be a very hot debate. Um, uh, per Kramer, a uh, very renowned Swedish uh, uh, professor of international law at the University of Gothenburg, uh, he already in 2006 uh, attached attention to, to the problem that if Sweden opens a repository, you might be more or less forced to take the EU waste. Uh, the same has been said uh, by, uh, by an other uh, Swede, Joran Sundqvist, he's a sociologi so sociologist at the University of Gothenburg. He said it in an interview uh, in June, where he said that even if today our a bilateral agreement with the EU uh, uh, prohibits this, there are always ways that you can change the, the minds. And even if it wouldn't be made by directives and laws, it could be made by call for common responsibility and cooperation. And you know that this always works in the European Union. Um, considering the fact that uh, Finland produces so much energy and will produce more energy with uh, uh, nuclear power, there is also now the debate of uranium mining, as you have here in, 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 uh, in uh, Sweden. And uh, we already start with uh, prospecting in Kusamo, which is up uh, north and in North Karelia. Uh, I was there uh, two weeks and weekends ago and saw the boreholes. And our uh, minister, Mauri Pekkarinen, who is responsible for all this, he says it's absolutely clear. If we produce uh, nuclear energy, we have also to, to do our own mining. So we have very little hope uh, that we can stop it. And uh, all this is also very much implemented in the EU treaties and in Euratom, about which uh, Birgitta will talk. So I won't go into this. But I see the Euratom Treaty as a real danger to us. What comes to uranium mining and what comes to uh, the, the, the waste. And the, the mining would maybe be problematic if we now get a prospecting showing that we have the resources, that we have resources enough. And if there then is a shortage in the EU, they could say, but you have resources. And if you don't mine them, you don't get anything from us from our, uh, because we have this common uh, um, uh, fuel market. So this is what you might go into. This is the story, and I will ask many of you to help us in the, uh, deba uh, in the, in the campaign. Niklas and many others here have sent a lot of good statements to the authorities during the years. And uh, unfortunately, I have to ask you to do that again. <laughs> renowned geologist Nils Axel Möller. He has great respect for other geologists around the world, I know. <laughs> so, where have you at? Here. Thank you. Okay, my friends. I am Niklas Mono and I represent Milkas here on a scientific advisor to them. Uh, and I will say elusive final uh, <laughs> solution because many people in many subjects have believed that there is a final solution. I mean, common sense reacts immediately. And in, in this little pamphlet, 
er det bok. It's written up the story also. Don't listen to Nuclear waste calls for long-term isolation and then strict safety. And you know why? Because of the toxicity. Geology is the key of meaningful long-term assessment of adequate, whatever that could be, safety for any type of subsurface storage of high level of okay. So we must do something. Of course, we have it, even if you don't like it. If it even if it's imposed on us, we have to do something. And we will try to. And people say that there is a solution. I will try to show that it certainly is not. The everlasting waste. We can never get rid of waste, as a matter of fact. But we can just place it out of sight, or what is worse, place it out of our control. Mm. And when then it's, it's the waste which is ruling us, mm. not we are ruling the waste. And that's not a good way. In way. Every, from when farmers start to th throw garbage in the forest, uh, we learn that it was bad. And then step by step, it has been, now we are polluting the, the, the lithosphere. And that's really hard to then um, solve. If ever. As long as uncertainty remains, we must keep the control, I think. Besides, the toxicity of the waste is so high that it will last for hundreds of thousands of years. So, my friend, what can we do? And I try to say a few things about that. First of all, there is, you have it in, do you have this picture in this one? So I can take it a little fast. This is the KBS3 so-called solution. But that so-called solution was based uh, on things one believed in the middle of the 70s, that it was completely uh, stable crust. We didn't know it. All those things which formulated the idea of it, it's gone. They are away. They doesn't exist in geology any longer. Huh. Only in the minds of the people, geologists in SKB. So they wanted to put it as Per said, of course, under the water, uh, close to the Baltic, under the groundwater, under the groundwater, 500 meters down, close it back, never be able to touch it again unless with violence, and then it's closed, and by that it's final. And they think they, by that, have solved it. But solving it, then it should be not affecting us any longer. And certainly, this will come back to us in the coming period. Another way, which I'm personally saying, not as a solution, but as a possibility to do what I think the best under the bad circumstances we have been forced to act with it. It is to put it on a hill and then it could be inland of course, but much better. And it's above the groundwater and it's a controlled drain system. And it is of course, you can put bombs on it, nothing will happen because it's far down in the rock. <coughs> but it is accessible, controllable. Controllable for the good and for the bad. Because those are things. If anything goes wrong, you should repair it. For the bad, good thing, if any solution comes in the future, one of them is, of course, this, which we have been discussing here. <laughs> if that ever comes to, to, to a. <laughs> yeah, but that is. You know, yes, yeah. But that's a very great difference, you know. For me, at any rate, as a scientist, we can believe in technology. That's okay, because. People can make achievements, scientific solutions, but we can never accept that we rape nature and the natural processes. The natural processes, we simply have to learn and we have to play and let them control our handling. That's a very, very great difference. And that's why I cannot accept this, because we are violent thing, the natural laws. And then maybe the technology for me is better. OK, that's the two options. And uh, of course, we have something in this club that is uh, um, the canister being put in water caverns, basins, in order to be chilled. And they say here it may last this for 100 years 
and then they add or more. Okay? Or more. So that means that we are up here. This is a logarithmic time. One year, ten years, hundred years, thousand years, ten thousand years. And of course, this has absolutely zero if you pet some sort of safety. It has no safety at all. An ordinary bomb, boop, and it will go. Uh, um, a stop in the electric power, and it's very serious. You know. so that is the really, the sooner we get rid of that, the better. But they, they have to go up there, and then comes what I'm discussing, the future ice age. And I will show the processes which certainly say that it's impossible to sit, because those people, they have made computer models, and then they are sitting in a chair in their office. And, ah, it will work. <laughs> of course it does. will not work. Because this, they just want to get rid of it. <laughs> so here, no way out in the future. And we have to, no, not 5,000 years. We have to go 100,000 years or even more. The other way, this is dry rock. Then, of course, it is, it is up here. It's very good seal up, but it's controllable, accessible, and you may even move it. And used for transmutation. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Of course, that is. Can you say is, that, please? You haven't said that. It's coming. Coming, coming. So, then we are discussing the old concept, the thing which SKV and, and POSIVA are resting upon. They are resting upon condensation. Oh, this is solid. But it's just that's liquid. It's nothing. It's really bad what they are leaving. And it's so old fashioned. It was maybe good 30 years ago. No. But it's not modern geology. It's just wiped out. And I happen to know all these things. I had a, we have a, had a really super international geological congress in, in Oslo where we have these things up. And I had one excursion in Sweden before the conference and one after. And we had a lot of top people of the world uh, seeing those gravel, including the one which um, Dita took a photo of this summer and it's here. <clears throat> which is absolutely the largest structure ever shown in the world of liquefaction. That's not bad. I had one of the best that I said, God, this must be the largest f structure ever, ever shown. And they used that one. So it's, it's not a bad thing, it's a good one. So they have f full stability. And it's like a full thing, and it goes down and poof, the other goes up. Full stability. Of course not, there's no stability. Earthquake. They calculate that the maximum earthquake in Forsmite, for example, could be 0.1 in 100,000 years. <laughs> How do you do that? It means one magnitude seven earthquake in one million years, which is 100,000 years, 0.1. Okay? But we have had five in 10,000 years. <laughs> if we have had five in just in Forsmite, then there is an additional seven up in Hudiksvall, very close. And it's an additional 14 in the Meladalen region. So in this area, it's lots of them. And out of this, how can you make 0.1? Mm -hmm. I mean, what kind of mathematics is it? What kind of mathematics? A school child could say. And instead of this, we had hundreds of magnitude seven, ten, <coughs> tens of magnitude eight, and even some or magnitude not. Only old structure is reactivated. We see new fracture, new faults, I would say something. Stable plinths, it doesn't exist. We have a wonderful example in Finland <laughs> where it's perfect, we call it stable plinth, surrounded by which it, it was fractured right uh, across it. We have something, they don't have enough room to put the canisters. There's a lot of canisters. So they, if they have, like this, they should be on this one. Here is the fault. It moves this one. But they put the canister in, in this block. Okay? But how far from the edges? I mean, geologists say kilometers, many, many kilometers. They say 50 to 100 meters. <laughs> and if they don't get 50 to 100 meters, there's no room any longer. So this is a vital thing, and we say this. Then something which they haven't even heard about. They cannot even spell it. Uh, Methan-Wenting. I will say something about it. And then a lot of other things. And then, of course, 
They have, they are engineers doing it. They have and computer people. They have steady states because that's the only way of calculating. So they make something and calculate it. We have dynamic system which always changes. So it means the thing which applies here doesn't apply here, and the ta 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 ta. -ta. This is dynamicity. Okay. Uh, so we have. To reliable, unreliable, today and during 100,000 years. SKB and Posiva claims that they have, is reliable today. We, the rest of the world, say, oh, it's a lot of things which remains um, to solve, to show, to improve. It's not at all clear. Many, many things, just how, how they seal off. They have, they have tunnels. Okay? In these tunnels, how do you seal it? From here, okay. this should be blocks of, of, of bentonite. But up here, and how do you seal it? It's really very complicated when it's high pressure and water and so on. So there are many things here. They make assumptions and models, assumptions and models, and say, ah, 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 this will also last for, so we can guarantee it for 100,000 years. The rest of us say, no, 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 for heaven's sake, uh, you are in problem here. The stability co um, concepts have, have collapsed. The Shakespeare concept have collapsed. The respect distance doesn't work. Method explosive wenting is a new thing. And lots and lots of other things. So we cannot accept this for sure, for sure. And as a matter of fact, it's much, <coughs> very, very simple. Because any one of you, anyone, we can go out in the street, stop children and all. You think that we can guarantee full safety for 100,000 years? down in the bedroom. No. You don't do that. It's common sense. But now common sense and ge modern geology say the same. OK, I say a few things. We have, instead of having very little earthquakes, if you go back in time to d during the <coughs> time after the Ice Age, when the uplift in Stockholm was 15 centimeters, it means 0.4 millimeter per day, per day. So of course, ro rock fracture. So we have a lot of, here we have 14 in this region, here we have 13 in this region, we have five up here, in four, right in Forsman, <coughs> seven up in this, uh, uh, five in, uh, and then the, um, the, those up in the north. And of course, if you take time, 5,000, 10,000, 13,000, and a little older. By the way, this is very interesting because some of the models they have done, it only operates if there is nothing here. So <clears throat> this is not innocent. What is KV? They take only the present day. This is earthquakes, and you see this is the magnitude. So today, it's just above 4. That's the maximum magnitude. In historical data, it's 5.4. And in Earth, in paleoseismic old data, we are seven very well above eight. So we are in the yellow box in the paleo, they are in the blue box in today's. And as a matter of fact, they only measured 25 years between 1956 and 1971. It's really a very, very bad database. <coughs> and they projected it into the future. Here they have one magnitude seven in. in uh, in 100,000 years, and then now they are down here at 0.1 about, but if we take the yellow one, which is a reality, instead of having maximum one, I said, but it's really they say now 0.1. We have hundreds of thousands of magnitude, much more than 10 of this. And with this material, the, the um, repository of KBS that cannot be even, even suggested to, to, to uh, last for, the, for, for a long time. Then comes the di diagram on, on, on which they base the, the idea of, of a respect distance. This is 10, 1001 kilometer from a fort, from this one. Okay? Here, this has moved. From this one. There they say, the magnitude of displacement. You can say this is 8, 8.2, 8, 8 7.9. It's very high magnitude. 
and one kilometer away, they say, there is nothing more than <coughs> one decimeter of fracture. No displacement. Therefore, we can come 50 to 1. We can be this close because we are magnitude 7, they say, is the highest. It's only 5 centimeters, and the canister can take that. <coughs> that is model. But model could be good, model could be bad. Then we go to reality. This is the blue box. And there we say reality far above, far, far above it, and far beyond one kilometer, far up to, to, to 100 kilometers, 10 kilometers. We have meters of displacement. So this, this uh, idea of 50 is just the geological insight. We must talk about this. And as a matter of fact, this is really remarkable because we have no longer room enough for the SKB. There's no longer room enough. If this, if I'm right here, and we have observation, this is observation, this is model, and observation usually are better. Okay? So then they don't have room enough, and then they should be remembered compared to the processes. This is a model which was done by Serba uh, '92 in in. Italy. That's observation method. Magnitude 7 earthquake, and this is the fault. What? It's not just one line, but it's, it's like a butterfly <coughs> uh, flowering up, flower structure. <coughs> and then you have sympathetic, because it's working here, things happen here. So where do we have a respect distance here? <laughs> Le less than one. Here. It is 10 kilometers. And it's absurd. So why do you, if KBS days would have put it here, and a <laughs> would have come and be right through the repository. And that's what we are talking about. And that is reality contract nonsense. <coughs> this is our own example now from 9,663 years before present earthquake in Hüdigsvall. Why we can say this is because we have the barbed clay. So we can give it within a year. In another case, we have it even in the autumn of our 10,430. And that is seen in autumn, is seen at two places, 70 kilometers in between them. And uh, uh, <coughs> a few weeks ago, I had showed a school class, uh, just warm clay, and we could, even there we could see this. This is the third time I have the autumn. At any rate, now we have Hüdigsvall. We have an earthquake. We below the epicenter, it's a huge scarp that is trusted up and your ice flows. The ice flow came this way and still it's there. So you can be sure that this happened after ice had gone. And this is the facet of this fault. We have it there and 12 kilometers away. 12 kilometers, you have this. <laughs> and what about the diagram which said you cannot have fracturing more than one decimeter? But here, the whole rock is about, pfft, like you have put a dynamite in it. So this is it. But we think that it's a combination with something which I will talk about. Method of entry, but also the earthquake. And this fracture is seen 40 kilometers away. So it's a big thing. And we have about 100 sites. 100 sites. And I have investigated 50 about them. So we really map them. Now we come to this method of entry which is an interesting thing. I can work. Methane, methane, you know that that's a gas. It can, it can occur in two shapes. In gas and as an ice. Gas or methane hydrate. And pressure and temperature. Temperature there, pressure here. Water depth or depth in the bedrock. Those control if it's gas or Hydrate. So here we can have it below this, we can have, but then we have the geothermal gradient. So uh, we um, can only have it below um, uh, in the lower part. But when we have permafrost, this geothermal gradient in there, instead of being here, moves here. And because of this, we can have it 80 meters. Also. And when we have it covered by ice, it goes all the way above. So we can have it all to the surface. And methane is degassing all the time. 
and I can give you a little example. In these stupid people in the Holland Sosen Tunnel, okay, <laughs> what are they doing? What are they doing now? They are freezing the bedrock to minus 40 degrees. <whistles> minus 40 degrees down here. And it's quite high pressure. I don't say that, and it's, they, it's a fracture zone, where right? all the time is degasymethane. So if they, I have to write this down for them. But uh, I haven't done that, but I can share it with you a little. So if they are badly off, you know, the, the moment when they take off the chili and have finished the tunnel, poof, it all <laughs> I mean, I don't say that it is, but there is a possibility, a very strong possibility. All depends upon how much g gas is coming from the knees. But we know that in those things, we are the gassing all day. And in Olkiloto, that is one of the worst places because there it's measured in the, in the drill hole. It was very full of earth and gas. And then the surrounding is pockmarks on you know, the sea, seabed because it has been blown up. So um, this is something to believe. And why do I say this? Because we have a fantastic hill. 75 meter high with up to uh, uh, 2,000 ton big blocks which have been thrown up in the air. Uh, uh, and it's resting, resting here on a beach. We know that the beach is 3,200 years, so it must be younger. And then we could work and see where the shore was. The shore was at 80 meters at that time. It means 2,000 years ago. It was an explosive metal venting. It set up a tsunami wave, which, which entered into bogs. We have a bog with a shell bank in the bog. Shell bank, marine shell bank shouldn't be in the bog. And one thing. And the other thing, Lake Dellen was dammed three meters. Lake Dellen is 37 meters. The bog is 38. So this is a really remarkable thing. And it was a subsurface explosive Methane of venting of methane gas, gas from the sudden phase transition from methane hydrate to methane gas, I believe. But this is a new thing, and no, but nobody it has not been investigated and not been studied. <laughs> but we have a couple of examples otherwise in another place above where, where, where we couldn't understand it, but now it seems very clear. So there is no solution, just a gradation of lights. <laughs> the best thing to do must be to keep the freedom of action, to keep the control of the waste. Because if you don't have a solution, don't give it to somebody you cannot. SKB continues to claim that they have an ultimate solution, which will guarantee full safety for 100,000 years. This, but remember that they are doing this because nuclear power is supposed to run only if they have yeah. a solution of the waste. Mm -hmm. So they have something in the back, you know, <laughs> pulling them, that they have to claim it. But no one should go into something which is dishonest. That's another thing. So this is nothing but a scientific nonsense, of course. And there will be a sem seminar on September 25th, which is called From Politics to Solution. We <laughs> have the solution. So, will be another day of disinformation mm. and lies. I think, so what should we do? I think, let us admit that we cannot guarantee it. We have to admit it and see what could, should we, how should we handle in the best possible way. Not a solution, just the best, to keep with the freedom of action and possible of the control. We have a proposal to harmonize with modern scientific knowledge, that's the for that. Environmental concern, don't pollute it. Energy concern, if we have energy sources, we can, there is not 94, 96% of the energy is left in the so called waste. I used to say, if who of us go into Ica, buy lingon barrier, lingon barriers, which is so nice, open it and take one spoon. <coughs> Delicious, yeah. close as yeah. all oh, the rest is waste. <laughs> we don't do that, but of course this is dangerous. So it's not an analog, but we should remember it, because in the future we will maybe in a period where energy runs out. So we have really seen. Today we are just beginning to see a problem. Mm -hmm. 
Um, so this is and technological in innovation. This is comes, of course, to what we are discussing here. Uh, many of these things are today completely doesn't look good at all, but it's 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 a, in the human's hand to solve it. But in order to, we cannot do it with a <coughs> process. So for me, as I have 5,000 canister, it, put it in the dry rock deposition. It's shielded, accessible, controllable. We have freedom, remain freedom of action, technological innovation. innovation. Here comes a future, not today, future, if it is. And the interesting thing with this, if it ever comes there, they have 40 years lifetime. So if they should solve anything, it's not something which, have, which <coughs> becomes solved in 100 years. It's something which is in the near future. But this is just an option. I don't plead so much. And of course, if we do that, we get one-tenth, which is 500 canisters. And five canisters would very easily fit in two deep, very super deep boroughs, five, three to four kilometers, three to five kilometers depth. Well, if you have all of it, you have to have 20, and you can pose completely other problems. But this is one, and of course you get the energy. So that is a possibility. In conclusion, final solution is a big bluffer. <laughs> uh, truly, it is nothing but a dead end. Yeah. As, a, as a serious way of handling the waste and as a long-term destiny for life on Earth. Because this is what it all really concerned, the destiny of life on Earth. Because we are sitting here, but we don't end Earth in 100 years or 1,000 years or, or 10,000. We just have a continuity. We must always do everything possible to pre preserve environment and to use the KBS and POSIVA method is really very, very bad. Yeah. But of course, we have to discuss it, we have to debate it. In Sweden, there is still, so to say, a way back. But in Finland, they have done this um, remarkable thing that they have given, given um, preliminary um, dis um, decision that they can start it, and during the process of working, they could improve it and solve the support request. Yes. Thank you. Now I'm especially proud to introduce Dr. Chris Busby. He's a scientist and a expert on low-level uh, radiation. My person starts staying on the hand. Yes, thank you, Dr. Chris Busby. And there uh, is a interesting parallel situation. They used to say, we used to say in the environmental movement, that the Irish Sea between England and Ireland was the most radioactive in the world. But I've told you today that the international experts now say it's the Baltic Sea. But anyway, it's a parallel situation. The problems that uh, they ha have with the solar field and the pollution of the Irish Sea is very similar to the problem we have with the Baltic Sea here. Yes? Okay. <laughs> Down. Well, I wasn't quite sure what I was going to talk about today. Um, Pear wanted me to talk mainly about the health effects of, of uh, the consequences of the pollution of the Irish Sea, which I've had quite a lot to do with. I've been involved in some court cases in Ireland, and I was uh, funded by the Irish government too to look into the health effects. So I'm going to talk a bit about that. Okay. So I'm going to talk a bit about that. Um, but I want to say a few things to start off with. Uh, 
which have occurred to me as a result of listening to the eminent speakers that have come before me. And also, I want to give you a little bit of good news, too. Um, in this game, you know, and I've been in this game for a long time now, um, there's not a lot of good news. What we see is we see people who are making reasonable arguments, who are consistently showing that the evidence from um, the authorities is bunk, is nonsense, is, is even mathematically stupid, um, and yet they continue to produce their arguments and continue to build their power stations and, and, and so forth, which is very depressing, I think you will all agree. So there are two bits of good news. The first, the first is that um, I'm, I, I, I've been working in America a lot in, on court cases. And in America, they have these lawyers who pursue uh, large companies in order to make huge sums of money. They're, they're called ambulance chasers. <laughs> and they're, they're kind of like, um, they're a bit like uh, uh, outlaws in many ways. But what they do succeed in doing is attacking the nuclear industry and attacking people who are causing pollution uh, and killing children, killing adults. And I, I've been working as an expert witness for these people, which is very stressful, but also quite lucrative. Uh, and also, we're winning cases now. Because when you get the arguments that, that, we were been to that we've all been talking about for many years, the scientific arguments, when we take them on, on the level of science, and we get these arguments in front of juries, and actually, they don't usually allow the argument to get to the jury because they don't want the publicity. So they usually settle out of court before it ever gets to the jury. But I can tell you that they, they are settling out of court. They're, they're realizing that they're not going to be allowed to, 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 they cannot permit these arguments to go before legal cases because the legal cases will then be lost. And then the, and then the publicity will result in everybody knowing that their arguments are spurious and that they're empty and that they're worthless. Mm. And, another, and there's another point here too. I, last year I was invited to Kuala Lumpur by the ex-president uh, and we set up a war crimes tribunal for Tony Blair and for um, George W. Bush. Um, and as part of that I was pursuing the idea of criminalizing scientific um, bias. Um, because it seemed to me then, and it still seems to me now, that in a court of law, if you give false evidence, then you can be um, sent to jail for perjury. And yet, consistently, we see scientists operating for the nuclear industry and for governments, consistently giving false evidence, and I think in many cases knowing that they're giving false evidence, mm -hmm. creating stupid models that, that can be dismantled by anybody, a school child very often mm -hmm. can be dismantled and shown to be wrong. Now, these people, <laughs> are responsible for the deaths of hundreds of thousands, perhaps millions of people, by giving this false evidence. Since 1952 and, and the increasing pollution of the planet from these radioactive substances and from uranium, as I will explain, um, millions of people have died prematurely. Millions of people. And this is a much larger uh, health um, scandal, public health scandal, um, then, then, then the, the, the Holocaust, you know, we, we are inclined to believe that the most terrible things that happened on the planet are the things that were done by the Germans in the Second World War and various other war crimes like that. But the war crime associated with, it, it, with, with underpinning a, an operation that has killed millions of people in horrible ways by lying about the effects of low-level radiation, these people should be sent to jail. Mm. At very minimum, they should be criminalized. So I wanted to say that before I started. The second thing I wanted to say is that in the last 10 years, I've been more and more interested in uranium. Mm. And I've been doing a lot of research on uranium, which has culminated in about 2003, 2004, discovering that there's a completely new way in which uranium can, can be considered to be hazardous. It, uranium is radioactive, we all know, but it's very weakly radioactive. And, and in the depleted uranium area, or in the area of uranium mining, the authorities will say, oh, it's, it's not much of a hazard, because it has a very long half-life, and its radioactivity is very, very low. And there are various arguments we can, we, can, we can manifest in opposition to that. We can say it's an alpha emitter, and it's inside you, and it has all these properties of attacking local tissue, and so forth. But there's another way in which uranium harms people, 
and that is through the amplification of natural background radiation. And I eventually managed, with much fighting, with an enormous amount of aggro, and if I look tired, it's because I am, <laughs> um, I, I have managed to get this now involved at the highest level. The International Commission on Radiological Protection has put three people onto studying this idea, uh, which is a fairly simple idea, it's fairly easy to understand. And um, it, it was really, it, the story was released in uh, New Scientist last week, and I brought some, I brought some cop photocopies of the New Scientist article, which I've left at the back. And if they're not enough, I've got some more as well. But I'm going to give another talk on Friday in the evening, where I'll talk more about this this um, this this theory. Anyway, the point about uranium is this: it is the blood supply of the nuclear industry. And it has to be mined, it has to be pulled out of the ground. And the largest producer of uranium is Arriba. And most of the uranium is in Canada. And now, when they pull this stuff out of the ground, the ground in these areas usually belongs to um, local people, ethnic tribes people. In America, what we used to call the Red Indians, but as a member of the Green Party, I'm no longer allowed to call them that. Um, but you know what I mean. And these people are, are opposed to uranium mining, and they have, they have the rights associated with these bits of land, these tracts of land. And perhaps you have the same thing in northern Finland as well. They, these primitive people have rights, or primitive people, ha ha, have rights. And so if you take the laws that uh, allow these people to object to particular operations carrying out, then you can, you can put these laws in opposition to the uh, endeavors of com big companies like Arriva. And let's not forget, this is the French, basically the French state. Yeah. The, the French state is the nuclear state. And Arriva are now trying to export the Frenchification of energy all over the world. And so they are the enemy. And perhaps we can use this new uranium idea in courts to prevent them taking this stuff. Because there are laws encapsulated in uratum. And the Euratom laws say that you cannot have more than a certain amount of radiation in a year, one millisiever. Or from, from one operation, it's actually one-tenth of a millisiever. Now, if the uranium in your body is increasing the natural background radiation dose by the amount that I'm almost certain that it is, and we've modeled this using a big program from CERN called Fluca, then you have an explanation for all of the depleted uranium effects that have been observed in Iraq and in the soldiers, but you also have explanations for the uranium effects in the Navajo Indians mm -hmm. and in other people who have been associated with mining. And these effects have always been discounted on the basis that the dose of radiation is too low. But if the uranium is absorbing natural background radiation and re-emitting it into the DNA as photoelectrons, then the dose is very high. And they cannot argue that this dose is not very high because it's just standard physics, you understand? And so if that dose is higher than the amount that they're allowed to give you under the present Euratom regulations, then that's it. They're finished. So this is a good way in. So I, I advise you to use this as a weapon. I have forged this weapon. It's, it's made of gold and platinum and jewels, precious stones, and you can kill them with it. Anyway, let's go on to Celepi, right? Um, Oh yes, well this is the other you see here that I'm a professor, <coughs> this is very impressive. Uh, I, uh, I, I was a visiting lecturer at the University of Liverpool and the American nuclear industry got really upset because this gave me some credibility in the American courts. So they contacted the Liverpool <coughs> University and they kicked me out. So I, I, was, I was no longer even uh, associated with the university. And you know, in the world at the moment, unless you're associated with the university, you don't exist. You know, you're just an activist. You can't be a scientist. So anyway, luckily, the University of Ulster, which is kind of a reasonable university, they decided to make me a professor. So hey, look at that. Anyway, isn't that impressive? It impresses me. <coughs> All right. And now I've got lots and lots of slides here, but I know there's not enough time. So I want to sort of... You'll have to, somebody will have to wave at me and say how much we'll time, time there is, okay? Because I wasn't sure who I was going to talk to, you know, it could have been people who knew nothing about radiation. It seems to me most of you know everything about radiation, so I don't have to go too, too deeply into, into the radiation itself and what it is and how it works. I, I, I really just want to talk to you about the consequences uh, for people who live near coasts that are contaminated with material from, from, from fission products, and uranium, in fact, it, it now turns out. 
Um, the summary of my argument is here, is that the childhood cancer, and I'm talking about nearly all childhood cancer now, incidentally, um, is, I believe, caused by internal exposure to no novel man-made radioactive isotopes and also to uranium. And in fact, as I'll show in a graph later on, if you were to plot, if you were to plot the world uranium production, or the world radium production, which amounts to the same thing, from about 1900 onwards, you will get a perfect correlation with the increase in childhood leukemia. Childhood leukemia is a new disease, incidentally. It, it's a disease which appeared at the beginning of this century, and it last has century. its peak. Last century. Last, last century. Sorry. Mm -hmm. Yes. No. <coughs> uh, and it has its peak in the in the naught to, to four year old. So as 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 a kind of disease, it's it's novel, and that increase, which went has just gone up and up and up and up, and is still increasing. Um, is associated with the world production of uranium. Now, the second point is that the model that currently underpins the operation of the nuclear industry is the model of the International Commission on Radiological Protection. And it averages doses over the whole of, of large masses. The dose is energy per unit mass. So there's a huge error inside the present risk model. Um, now, the, at the same time, there have been reports since 1982 of childhood leukemia increases near nuclear sites. Uh, and it began with the, with the observation of the Sellafield leukemia cluster in 1983. And there was a, a, a public inquiry about that. And of course, the nukes, nuclear um, industry and their uh, risk model friends came along and said, well, the doses were too low. So this was the first suggestion that you had a complete a complete opposition between what in science we would call deductive logic and inductive logic. In, f in scientific philosophy, you always use inductive logic. So you look at all the th events that might occur, and you look to see what is common between those events, and that's probably the cause of the events. That's the philosophy of science. That's how it works. That's how it's worked since, since it was first started in the, in the 12th century. Nevertheless, what we have with the nuclear logic is we have deduction. They say, here are some people who are Japanese survivors of a huge atomic bomb, and they received this dose, and this is the number of cancers they got, and now these people have got tiny, tiny doses compared to that, so therefore if they've got cancer, it cannot be caused by the radiation. Now this is complete nonsense. This is philosophically nonsense. And this is a good way to attack them in court, incidentally, because the, the people in court like logic, you know, that's how they operate. So if you can, if you can start talking about Francis Bacon and, and, uh, and Descartes and, you know, Schopenhauer and so on, I mean, they love it. Because they don't understand all this science stuff, you know. And in fact, I was in an American court in Kentucky where the case was thrown out, incidentally. And the, and the judge came in and he said, hey, in Kentucky, we don't worry about this science stuff. We just do what is right. <laughs> they great, those people there. Um, okay, so, and then now, so to prove that that is the case, not only were all these nuclear sites producing childhood leukemias, and in fact, recently, last year, there was a huge study by the Germans um, who looked at all of the nuclear plants in Germany. Of course, they can do that now because the Germans don't want any more nuclear power, you see, so they can get away with that. And the Greens forced them to do this, the Green Party. Um, and so they discovered that there was a, a, a big increase in childhood leukemia in children living within five kilometers of the plant. And this has also been discovered in, in Cap de la Hague and, and, of course, Stella Field, and we found it at all the masts. And more or less everywhere that you look near a nuclear power station, you find childhood leukemia increases. And it, now the point is that we know what the doses are to those children. In terms of conventional doses, they've been studied, I mean, right back in 1983 when the British started to, first were saying that the doses were too low, they knew what the doses were. So in order for those to be causal, in order for the leukemias to be caused by those doses, in terms of the current risk model, the model has to be out by a factor of about 400 to 1,000 times. It varies depending upon the nuclear site, but particularly Sellafield is a very dirty one. However, there have been increases in infant leukemia published in, in, uh, in the literature by four different groups of scientists from America, from Greece, from Germany, which show that there is in fact an increase in infant leukemia only in those children who were in the womb at the time of the Chernobyl accident. 
Now, those children, we know what their doses were, and there's nothing else that could have occurred to them which would have caused leukemia. And that also shows this error of approximately the same number. So we can say that for external and internal radiation, there's a mistake in terms of the dose response, the dose and the, and the, the, the cancers of, of up to a thousand times. And of course, this has serious consequences for children and adults living near the Irish Sea. And of course, it will be children and adults living near the Baltic. But you will never know. And the reason you will never know is because the cancer <coughs> registries are in on this scam. The cancer registries are being controlled to prevent data coming out to small areas. We all know that there's a cancer epidemic. Everybody knows somebody who's dying of cancer or has died of cancer, loved ones. Children are dying of cancer, budgerigars and fish and uh, dogs and cats. Everybody's dying of cancer. Now why? Well, we know also that cancer is a genetic disease and so there's uh, these genetic diseases uh, that cause cancer are entirely environmental. The studies have been done with, uh, with identical twins and they've, they've been able to show that the, the genetic component of most cancers is less than 10%, which means that the cancers are caused by 90% by non-genetic or environmental influences. In fact, I wrote a book about this called Wolves of Water, which, which has some flyers for at the back of that. So, if you want to know what's causing the cancer, you, what you do is you look at, at epidemiology. You try to find the place, places in the world where the cancer rates are high, and then you try to look what is there in that place that might be causing that cancer. Because if the cancer increase in England and Wales is 30% greater in 1990 than it is in 1970, 30% increase, and probably here as well, I think I think I know that it's here as well, it's the same, because I've looked at it before, then something caused that cancer, and it has to be some genetic mut mutagen, something which creates genetic defects, which in, 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 in entered the world environment about 20 years before the, the cancer increased. And then, and then you have to look to see where the cancer increase is greater, and see whether, there, whether whatever it is that's, that's greater there than where it's lower, is something that could cause the cancer. Actually, the answer is simple. It's, it's radioactivity, and the radioactivity is from the weapons fallout originally, from the global nuclear testing. And then it was uh, added to by all of these games that they're playing with nuclear power stations and reprocessing plants and so on, La Hague, Dunray, Sellafield. I have to tell you a story about La Hague, incidentally. Um, they have these big tanks, which they have to keep cool, with ha have all the nuclear waste inside them. In 1998, I was told by this guy, um, in connection with this Irish case, that uh, they have to, uh, if they don't, they have to have backup generators to cool these things. You see, because if they if they don't, because they're so hot that they evaporate quite quickly, and if if the water evaporates, they can get to critical mass, and then they can go bang. And now this actually happened in 1957 in Kishtim in, in Russia, and it just spread nuclear waste everywhere. Now in, in, in Sellafield there are about 25 of these tanks and each one contains about the equivalent um, uh, amount of the Chernobyl accident that, that went everywhere, okay? So any one of these can go bang. And there are a lot of these in Cap de la Hague in the Cotentin Peninsula in north of France, you see. So in 1997, the electricity failed, poof. Then they went to the standby generator but it wouldn't start, okay? Right. So they had to get, so they were panicking, and everyone was fleeing, you know, they're, they're all, the, the, all the roads were blocked, everyone was running and trying to get away from Cap de la Hague, because they knew what would happen. And uh, they, tried, they, they sent off for a spare generator to try and, you know, cool it all down, and, they were, and the roads were blocked and this and that, and luckily, the electricity came back on again. And what happened, it, came, it, went, it went off, and then it came on again, while the generator had started, this is what happened. So, that, so the electricity went off, Generator cut in, electricity came back on and blew all the, blew all the fuses that, because, because of the various systems that were involved in cooling it, the generator system and the main system. And, the, and so it cut out and the generator packed up. So, so this can happen. It almost happened in La Hague in 1997. And that was another one of these tanks that would have gone poof. Okay. Well, I'm not going to go into all of this. This is the graph here, incidentally, of childhood leukemia against radium production. Okay. And this is from 1920, 1940, 1960. You can see that the increase in radium production and, and, childhood, and childhood leukemia more or less follow, them, follow each other. And this is the proof that I mentioned to you about Chernobyl. This is, the, this is a graph of the cesium-137 from Chernobyl as measured in whole body measurements <coughs> of human beings taken at Harwell. 
So you can see actually that the cesium got into the people and it lasted quite a long time. This second bump here is because winter silage, that's the grass, you know, it was cut in the summer, it was contaminated, and then it was fed to the animals in the winter time, and so it went, came back into the milk. So if we want to look at this period here, that's the period that people were contaminated. And these are the numbers of, child, of infant leukemias here in two-year two age groups from 1975 to 1994. And you can see there is a significant increase in infant leukemia. And infant leukemia is, the, is, is, in, is leukemia in, uh, in children who were in the first year of life. And these are plotted, these are plotted in terms of their, their, their period of time in the womb. We can work out what their doses were. And we got this error in the risk model. Of, of about 400 times. So we're going to sell a field now. This is an earlier version of myself in, in, in my mag magic jacket. Yeah, the same cap. Yeah, the same hat. The hat is the trademark. If I take off the hat, which I have to do in court, incidentally, <laughs> they, they, they don't know who I am. And, uh, I, met, I met this woman. I met this woman in Bristol, and she said, "Oh yes, I saw your colleague in court. You know, he was really very good." <laughs> I said yes. That's my brother. Um, okay. So, so this is my this is my uh, you know um, a activist hat. Yeah, that's right. Okay. And the TV people they're always asking me to take it off. You know, and I never do because I said nobody will recognise me. <laughs> okay. Well, you all know about it, but and I've more or less said 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 what's, what what the situation is with Sellafield. Sellafield is the largest producer of radioactive fission product waste, and also uranium, incidentally, which it knocks about one ton of uranium into the sea every year, into the Irish Sea, uh, in the whole of Europe. It, it's a massive, massive source of this stuff. And after the weapons fallout, after the, the fallout pollution contaminated the entire planet, Sellafield um, certainly took over. And in the 70s, it was creating vast, vast amounts of material. Um, and these are, the, these are the various leukemia clusters that have been discovered. This is taken from the, uh, the book, book, the European Committee on Radiation Risk uh, book, which we published in 2003. I started, this is the other thing I say to people, is, is create alternative institutions, you know? Um, because what you realize is that it's like the film The Wizard of Oz. The world is like The Wizard of Oz, you know? And so these people, they create their institutions, the, in, the International Commission on Radio, you know, and the United Nations Scientific... Well, to hell with them, you know? We can make our own ones. We can make the Stockholm Convention Committee. And, uh, you know, you just yeah. make the name up. Do anything you like. See? Yeah, and you can make your conventions and so on. So we created this thing called the European Committee on Radiation Risk, and it was so successful. I'm now being asked by the British government to advise them on radioactive waste disposal. No? What a laugh. So anyway, this, is, this is from the book. Uh, um, and we go into court and we get this book and we say, yes, this is the European... Co and of course they try to say that we're not official. But the point is they're not official either, you see, because they have to be independent. So, they're, so they're, they have to be very careful about saying that we're not official. They have to say that we're not considered to be right by most scientists. They have to reduce it to that. And then we ask them which scientists, you see. So then, so this, this, you can have a lot of fun with alternative institutions. Let me suggest this them to you. So you can see here that there have been childhood leukemia clusters discovered, like I said, in nearly every nuclear site where it's been looked at. So let's come back to the Irish Sea. The point about the Irish Sea, and in fact the Baltic is worse in this regard, because you can see here in the Irish Sea there's a gap at the bottom here. There's not much of a gap at the top. So all the crap that you put in the Irish Sea more or less stays there unless it's soluble in seawater. If it's soluble in seawater or if it's in fine enough particles and it can float away with the tides, it does so. But it's a, it's a measure of the extraordinary quantities that, that, that of, of radioactivity that they put in the Irish Sea that this stuff is found in the North Cape, it's found in, the, in, in, in Oslo, it's found all, all up the coast of Norway, it's found in the fish. Um, from, from uh, the, 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 the Newfoundland banks. It, it's everywhere, it's everywhere, it's radioactive. It has very long half-life, a lot of it, too. And it turns up in odd places, too. Very strange. Um, see, when they first decided to, start to use the sea as a repository, they said, oh, well, it's okay, you know, it just goes away. The sea is very big, after all, you throw stuff in the sea, it all goes away. So they just hoped that it would go away. Problem is, it doesn't go away. It concentrates in the intertidal sediment and so anywhere that you have fine sediment, so if you go to an inlet 
and you put your hand down and you come up and you go like this and it's like slimy, it's very, very fine particles, you can be sure that that's where the radioactivity is. And people who live near there are, are in danger. This is an example of the mud flats here at Carlingford in, north, in the northern part of Ireland. And there's huge amounts of radioactivity. This is on the other side. This is 100 miles away from Sellafield. But because this inlet is an area of low tidal energy, so the tide doesn't go fast, it comes in very slowly like this. And then it goes out again very slowly. And this gives the time for all the little particles to, to, to fall out, you see? And, and so if you go here and you tread in it, you go up to about there in the mud. I've done a lot of this in mud hopping. Um, and I, uh, so there was a... That, that, the initial analysis of this area showed that there was a, an excess of child leukemia in this area. And we had to get the data from a local GP because, of course, again, the cancer registries will not give you the data. And this is probably true in Sweden as well. If you go to the Swedish cancer registry, you say, I want data down to the small areas, they'll say no. They'll say confidentiality. It's nonsense. The reason is they don't want you to know where the cancers are. If you were to find that they were all along the coast, like I have, then people would be upset, naturally. You know, it would, the house prices would change, you know, nobody would want to go on holiday and swim in the sea. It would be a bad scene for, for, for the economic system. Well, this is a, a load of stuff which I don't expect you to read. Um, but what we did, between 1997 and 2000, we analyzed a huge amount of data that was leaked to us from the Wales Cancer Registry. Um, and, the can and sh shortly after it was leaked to us, the cancer registry was closed down. <laughs> um, and everybody was sacked. The whole lot just phew, gone, you know? Because they knew that the cat was out of the bag. And then there was a new cancer registry came in, some new guy. And he said, oh, well, this was all data that was um, uh, erroneous. You know, there was a mistake. The children with leukemia were actually adults. And in fact, they weren't ill anyway. You know? they, they just happened to fall onto the piece of paper or something. Who knows? This chap, incidentally, we have, uh, as I will tell you, they, um, he, we've shopped him up to the British Medical Association. So we're we take action against these guys. You know, he, he's a biased scientist in the, in the pay of the government or covering up or whatever it is. You know? I, I gave a talk at the Royal Society in November of last year about scientific fraud. And so I put these names up. So I, 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 three or four people I put up as scientific fraudsters. And we can prove that they're fraudsters. And this, this guy is one of them. So I'll show you what we found briefly. Because this is, this is the important message for this meeting now. Because you're considering the possibility of citing some kind of reprocessing facility uh, or post spallation reprocessing facility along a coast which is already contaminated as a result of the Chernobyl radiation coming out and Sellafield and, and everything else. So these were the small areas that we looked at. The, each one of those areas, it's, quite a, it's not a very highly populated country, Wales, but about three million people. And some of these areas are smaller than others. These are towns, for example. But as a result of, of, of having figures from 1974 to 1990, we can collect these together and, and we can then measure the levels of, rate of, of, uh, of cancer by distance from the coast. And what we found was quite extraordinary at the time. We never expected to find this. You know? we, we thought that it, there might be an effect, but we didn't realize how, how close the effect was. The effect is very, very close to the coast. It's within one kilometer of the coast, you get a sudden increase in cancer. This is for all malignancies, and each one of these represents one of those small areas. And if you take the different kinds of cancers together and you plot them as, a, as an exponential, uh, if you do an exponential model, um, that's you're modeling them, them as now as if they were going to be higher, close to the coast, which you've already found, you find that there's a highly statistically significant effect for all kinds of cancers. And it was driven by high risks in the North Wales towns, which were close to areas of, of high levels of plutonium. Because these, 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 uh, these samples were all measured, you know, the radiological protection authorities in my country and the Ministry of Agriculture, they measure the concentration of these radioactive substances in the mud. Of course, the levels were quite small in terms of overall doses, but as I've said, these doses are really meaningless because we're talking about internal radiation. But these people eat fish more than others. Have you checked uh, the difference? Yes, then? yes. The people near the coast do eat fish more than others, and shellfish as well. So you can get this stuff inside the shellfish. That's true. But we have another explanation for this, which I'll, which I'll, I'll come to. 
And this is in the children. So we've got childhood cancer in this period as well. Also very high, close to the coast, you see. And of course, Sellafield is close to the coast. So what I'm, I'm suggesting is that, in fact, the Sellafield leukemia cluster was caused by proximity to the coast. And when they had a legal case in 1993, which they lost, they lost it on the basis, interestingly, that there were high levels of childhood cancer close to the coast and not close to Sellafield. And they said, therefore, it's not an effect due to radiation. <laughs> but, of course, but then, the, the, you see, the lawyers at that time, they, 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 they were trying to prove that it was the parental exposure, it was the exposure to the fathers that was the cause of the childhood leukemia. And because there were some children that were um, not, whose fathers were not in the nuclear industry and lived up the coast, the, the, the case was lost. Um, and this is true for brain tumors as well. So there's the brain tumors um, graph. I'll gallop through all of this. But all of this stuff, incidentally, is in this book, Wolves of Water, which the flyer is there. So if any of you are interested, this is the biggest source of all this data. I've put absolutely everything in there. But I've also put in some nice pictures and little asides and a few poems and some songs. And you, know, and you can stand on it, and it makes you two inches higher. <laughs> <laughs> so there are lots of reasons for buying that book, which is quite cheap, too, because it was, uh, it was uh, funded by a charity. So. So that's the basic message, that there was an increased risk. Now, the Welsh Office and the Committee on Medical Aspects of Radiation and Environment attacked me, of course, joined the queue. Um, and uh, this new cancer registry, WCISU, said that, they were, that, said that we were wrong, uh, but they didn't release any of the data backing up their claims. They said this was confidential. So, of course, with these cancer registries, what they do is they just say, hey, there's no problem. And you say, well, can we see the numbers? Say, hey, you can't. And so you have to rely on them being telling the truth, which we don't. Because wherever we go and look, we find 